thank you. Please rise if you are able for the call to worship. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the Lord of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I am saved from my enemies. And now as we praise this God, let's sing Come, let us sing unto the Lord. And as we do so, we'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5, printed in your bulletins. Again, 1, 4, and 5. Please be seated. 
Today we'll be reading from God's law from the book of Deuteronomy, but before I do so, you know, I think we often approach the law as, as a fence, as something that keeps us from doing wrong. And naturally, we often, we often view it, we may not articulate it this way, but we often view it as keeping us from something good, as from something that's easier, from something that's more pleasant. And again, that's not something we'll often articulate, but certainly in the world, and even among Christians, we often view the law this way, and so, before I read the law, I want to read a passage from Psalm 81, because it articulates how God views the law, how the law was designed for us. And this is, this is what God says in, in Psalm 81. He says, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. In your distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear me, my people, and I will warn you. If you would only listen to me, Israel, you shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not worship any god other than me. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. And that's, that's the purpose for the law. The purpose for the law is to allow us to live the lives that, that God intended and to point us to Christ and in Christ to have true freedom. So, fellow believers, let's listen as we read the law from the book of Deuteronomy. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And if we truly listen to this, we know that we have transgressed this law, that we have not walked in the way of freedom that God has set out for us. And so, as a congregation, let's, let's pray the prayer of confession that's printed in the bulletins. Lord, cause me to understand your grace, and in understanding grace, deliver me from ungratefulness. And now let's take just a couple minutes and pray silently before the Lord, confessing our sins.
brothers and sisters, hear what God ordains for those who, who seek his face. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And thanks be to God for this salvation. Now, as we read responsibly from Psalm uh, 43, I encourage you to turn in your bulletins um, to this passage, and we'll be reading it responsibly. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why is it so disturbed within me? Amen. Now, as um, we did pre-COVID, this would be the time when we would pass the offering page and uh, give back to God of our tithes and our offerings in that way. And certainly, um, still encourage everyone to do that. We have uh, plates at the back of the sanctuary, and um, if you're worshiping at home, we have information in the bulletin about uh, sending offerings that way. But I think it's important to remind ourselves during this time that, that the tithes and offerings is not simply a, a monetary tithe or offering. Um, it's, it's really much more than that. And I think the, the story um, I want to read this morning um, that Jesus told really, really um, depicts this of what, what the tithe really is intended to be. It's not, it's, again, it's not just about giving back money to God. It's not a tax. It's not a admissions ticket to, um, to worship. It's something much more representative of us giving back everything we have to God. And this is, this is the story uh, from Mark chapter 12. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which made a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So as we listen to a meditation over the next few minutes, um, I encourage everyone to, to think and to meditate and to use this time to pray. Are you offering out of either your abundance or um, your poverty, just the money that you have, or a portion of the money that you have? Or, like that widow, are you truly giving back to God everything that you have? Um, and so let's take a, a few minutes to, to meditate on that and to pray um, as we listen to this meditation.
thank you for the bounty with which you have blessed us. Father, certainly we look back over our lives and we can see how you've materially blessed us. But Father, so much more than that, when we take this time to reflect on how you sent your Son to save us from our sins, how you offered not just salvation, but eternal life, eternal life with you, Father. We know how much you've blessed us. And so, Father, we ask that you would give, uh, that you would use these, these tithes and offerings that we give back to you for your kingdom, and that you would use our lives, that you would use them for your glory, and that through our lives that we would witness of your amazing love to us and to those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as a congregation, let's confess our faith together. Um, to each other and to the world. So I ask you fellow believers, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now go before our Father in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this day that you have created, that you have set apart for the worship of you. For truly you are a God like no other, and it is good and right for us to exalt your name. As your servant David reflected so long ago, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. This morning as we sit in your presence, we too can attest with those who have gone before us that your greatness no one can fathom. For you, O Lord, are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. As we worship today, we know that none of us, not a single one, is worthy to be here, to be in your presence. Each one of us has gone astray after our own desires. We have doubted your goodness and your love, like our father Adam, reaching out in sin for the temptation of a life that appears better, but is in contravention to your way. We have not loved you and have failed to love our neighbor. And yet you, our Father, are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. You, who are both loving and just, desire not that we should perish, and so in your compassion you sent Jesus to hang on that cross where each of us should have been. Father, this love has seen no corollary in history. For it is a love that no created thing can recreate. And so, Father, we can but do what David instructed, to tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. And your power, your love, they are not limited to your saving work among your people. For the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Even those who reject you, your being and your sovereignty and your love, even these benefit from your goodness in fashioning this world and providing them with life and sustenance. And so, Father, though, we know not always why you work, why you destine some for salvation and some for destruction. We can nevertheless testify that you are righteous in all your ways and faithful in all you do. For indeed, you are near to all who call on you, to all who call on you in truth. 
Not a single person who calls out to you for salvation will be denied. And you fulfill the desires of those who fear you. You hear their cry and save them. And so, Father, it is good and right for us to praise and to extol your name forever and ever. This morning, we delight to meditate on your wonderful works, to proclaim your great deeds. As we do so, Father, we plead for salvation for more of our fellow human beings, that you would call more of them into your kingdom. In Karamoja, Uganda, we lift up Carla Van Essendelf and Joanna Grove, that you would be with them as they disciple other women in that village. Thank you for laying on their hearts this vivid realization of their need for prayers. I ask that we would be faithful in supporting these sisters of ours and bringing them before your throne and praying for the success of their teaching and discipleship efforts. That through the spiritual tragedy that has occurred in that community, that you would call more to yourself and give those who have faith in you a clear understanding of who you really are. Closer to home, we pray for David and Rebecca Graves in Iowa. Thank you for this very tangible evidence of your work in this world of how you have called people to this new church and have raised up leaders for this flock. Bless them and use this new congregation to bring glory to your name. And here at Bethel, Father, we pray for our witness to our friends and neighbors that we would be faithful in sharing the reason for our hope, especially as so many around us have lost hope. We ask that you would bless Glenn Taylor and his support to the assemblage, that whatever happens with this project, that he and others would be a testimony to those who live in this vicinity. We pray for the Bethel's Women's Fellowship Group, that their work would produce spiritual growth within this body and would continue to facilitate opportunities for demonstrating your mercy and hospitality to our community. Father, we bring before you our physical needs as well. We pray for Lally Small that you would grant her a rapid and complete healing from her hip replacement. We also pray for your provision for her when she begins recovery at home. We pray for Brian with Nell and his co-workers as one of them has been diagnosed with coronavirus. Please be with this man, we ask, and help him to recover quickly with no more serious symptoms. And be with Brian and the others who are around him as well that they would be spared from this disease. We pray as well for Gene Fleming's neighbor that through his recent diagnosis with Parkinson's that he would have a new urgency to listen to the testimony he has heard from Gene and perhaps others. Soften his heart to your gospel and give Gene additional opportunities to talk of your salvation. We also pray as you have taught us for those with civil authority this morning, we lift up those like Caleb Kirshner on the Loudoun Board of Supervisors, that these local leaders would carry out their responsibilities in a way that promotes harmony and peace and quietness. Father David wrote in the Psalms that you are trustworthy in all you promise and faithful in all you do. You uphold all who fall and lift up all who are bowed down. The scriptures contain abundant evidence of this truth in the life of David, how you called him from an obscure position to become the king of your chosen people, how you forgave him when he repented even though his sins were grievous, how you protected him from enemies, foreign and domestic, how you destined him to serve a small part in bringing your son into the world. Today, Father, we ask that you would give us a similar confidence in your love and in your plan that David wrote so often about in the Psalms. We know not how our lives will unfold, what you have in store for each of us, but we do know this truth of your word, that you are trustworthy in all you promise, and faithful in all you do. You uphold all who fall, and lift up all who are bowed down. And so today, as we lay these requests before you, we do so with confidence and with hopeful expectation and with peace in your ultimate provision. And we do so, Father, praying as a congregation, as Jesus taught us to, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we prepare to uh, hear God's word, please rise if you're able, and let's sing together, forever trusting in the Lord. Glorify your name. And 
And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see here in 2 Samuel chapter 22 what has been called David's song of deliverance. Um, we'll see here that this psalm uh, seems a little out of place. Uh, but we'll, we'll explore why the writer of, of uh, Samuel uh, probably put it here. It actually uh, speaks to us even more clearly the fact that it almost seems like it is out of place. But let us open our hearts and, and uh, incline our ears to hear now the word of the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 22. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from mine enemies. For the waves of death encompass me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord, to my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked, because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him his canopy. Thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were laid bare. At the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. With the merciful you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge, and he has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. 
You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. Those who hated me and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me as soon as they heard of me. They obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. So we see from the very beginning, uh, this chapter 22 of 2 Samuel is found in its entirety. It, it comes to us again as Psalm 18. Uh, it's, it's slightly different as it's uh, changed uh, as the psalmist uh, adapts it for the purpose of the worship of God by his people. But the people of Israel uh, read this psalm and they were encouraged. They, they saw the worthiness of the Lord displayed in the life of David. We see in, as he says in, from the very beginning in verse 1, that David spoke to the Lord the words of the song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So we see if we've been reading along in 2 Samuel and through the life of David, this seems a bit out of place. He hasn't been delivered from the hand of Saul just recently. That was quite a while ago, back in the book of 1 Samuel. Um, Samuel is actually one book. Uh, it was separated uh, over time in, in, uh, for canonical reasons. Um, it separates out the, the life of Saul and, and Samuel, to begin with, from the life of David. But remember that it was essentially one book for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and so the writer of the book of Samuel is ending this book, ending the life of David, reflecting back over the entire life of David. It's, it's reflecting actually back to the very beginning of 1 Samuel, where we may remember that uh, Hannah, who is uh, without child, prays to the Lord. She cries out to the Lord that he would hear her and give her a son. And we see in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. And there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. So this psalm of David in chapter 22 of 2 Samuel is echoing the very words of Hannah, who was given Samuel, the, the prophet who anointed David. So what we're seeing and what is communicated to us by this, it's not just a, a, a simple matter of 
literary device here, but this is uh, the Lord communicating to us. He established David. He established his kingship through David at the very beginning of Samuel, and now we're at the end of Samuel, where he shows he will not only establish his king, but he will uphold him through all generations, through all his trials, all his troubles. The Lord can be trusted. It speaks to us not only of the Lord's care for David, but also his care for the anointed one to come, the great son of David, Jesus Christ. And for you as well, in union with Christ, as you are united to Christ by faith, he will not only uphold you, but he will see you through to the end. This should be a great encouragement for us. And in verse 2, the, the uh, psalm of David here, he begins to extol the Lord and to ascribe worthiness to him. And over and over, he uses the pronoun, my. He says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. This emphatic use of the pronoun my, it's, it's very instructive for us. It, it's so easy to speak in terms about what God is, or who God is, or what God does. But it's a whole other world to speak of my God, my rock. He is my deliverer. Luther said of the 23rd Psalm that in the very beginning, the word my is the hinge on which the entire psalm turns. It's one thing to say the Lord is the shepherd. It's quite another thing altogether to say that the Lord is my shepherd. He will lead and guide me and care for me. The use of the word my, it indicates a personal relationship. A transaction has occurred between a holy and worthy God and an unworthy sinner who he has brought into his family and whom he will shepherd and guide and care for. One, one commentator has pointed out, no man is entitled to use the pronoun my when discussing God, unless you have been brought as an unworthy sinner to the very feet of a very worthy God who becomes your redeemer, who becomes my rock, my God, in whom I can trust. David expressed this with an even deeper understanding when he confessed in his life, against you, you only have I sinned. David knew what it meant that he was his God. He was his rock and his redeemer that he had sinned against. Knowing the grace of God is what brings David to this effusive praise here in verses 2 and 3. See, if you know the grace of God and the forgiveness of your sins, he reveals to you his worthiness. The unbeliever, ah, God, but what do I have to do with them? Remember the time in your life where you thought nothing of the Lord, and you refused to confess that He alone is worthy. But once you've been united to Christ, then His worthiness, and this word worthy, it, it, it has to do with weight. It, it actually is a, uh, it, it's a term that was used in financial transactions. You, you put a weight on one end of the scale and you weigh something else out the other. Which one is more worthy? Which, which one is worth more? Well, the Lord, when we are placed in the scales, all the worthiness is, belongs to the Lord. And when you realize that, when you have been brought to faith in Christ by the work of His Spirit, then you see the worthiness of the God of David. Chapter, uh, verse 4 of chapter 22. David, in ending his effusive praise here, 
He says, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. This is really an encapsulation of the entire psalm. These are our points here this morning because it really speaks to what David is saying. I call upon the Lord. In the old King James Version, it says, I will call upon the Lord. Because that verb that is used there, call, is actually in the Hebrew, it indicates an ongoing action. We don't just call upon the Lord, I'm saved, I'm good, let me live my life. We know that. That's not possible. We call upon the Lord and should each day. We call upon the Lord in times of our troubles. And we can be encouraged that He hears us, as the psalmist says, out of His holy hill. And we will see how David is answered. This is poetry, so we expect hyperbole. David paints quite a dire picture here. Uh, as we go on in verse 5 and 6, he says, The waves of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. This is almost word for word from what the prophet Jonah says as well. As he's cast into the sea and he sinks lower and lower and lower into the sea. And he's certain that there is nothing but death that is coming upon him. And these are the same words. The waves of death encompass me. But the, the psalmist here, David, uses this hyperbole to, to explain for us, to, to, to encourage us to enter in those times in our lives where we feel like there, there's no hope. There's, it's nothing but darkness. It's bleak. We're in conflict with one that was our friend, with one that we love. We can't seem to get past that. And, and it's nothing but darkness before us. And yet, this psalm brings us the hope. Because when you call to the Lord, you call to the one who is worthy to be called upon. David, he paints this picture, and, and it, it just summarizes his whole life that we've been reading about in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. David on the run from Saul. David on the run from Absalom. David battling the Philistines over and over. And then in the chapter just preceding this, he's battling the Philistines one last time as an elderly king. Still a mighty warrior, but he grows so weary and the enemy sees weakness in him and plots to kill him. But the Lord saves David. Because David is not just a man calling upon the Lord his God. Remember, David is the anointed one. He's pointing forward to that great day when the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, will come. David is crying out to a God whom he's already declared as his rock, his redeemer, his deliverer, his refuge, his savior. And how does God respond to this man? We see in verses 8 through 16, the earth reeled and rocked, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Wow. I mean, David could have just said, I cried to the Lord and the Lord responded to me and I was saved. End of story. But no, he, he paints a picture of what he sees is really going on. When we cry to the Lord, it's as if the earth is coming apart at the seams. The earth trembles and shakes. The Lord enters into our world to answer the cry of His people. That should bring great encouragement to us. He is worthy to be called upon. He alone controls the earth, the, the heavens, 
the universe in the palm of his hand. Shall he not answer you, his people? David shows us that he does. One commentator remarks, and he says, this picture of smoke going up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth, it's not exactly what we expect from the sweet hour of prayer with God. But David sees accurately what's really going on here. This is the God of the universe upholding his anointed one. This is the God of the universe who cares for you as a loving father when you cry to him. It should give us confidence that God hears and delivers his children from their enemies. And we see, as we look forward to that day, in Revelation chapter 11, a very similar picture. When the Lord Jesus, the, the great King, returns, in verse 19 it says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of His covenant was seen within His temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. This is the worthiness of the Lord Jesus being revealed in all of His fullness. His people will see that one day and rejoice. But see, worthiness being re referring to weight. We must remember with heaviness in our hearts that we will rejoice to see that revealed. But that weight is what the scripture says crushes the unbeliever. That, that worthiness that is a joy and a delight to his people is what crushes the sin and the sinner alike. He is worthy to be praised. Look at how the Lord has revealed himself to the anointed one. Back in verse 2 and 3. The Lord is a rock. The Lord is my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. He says my rock again. Over and over, David speaks of the Lord as a rock. See, in the desert where David spent many years running from his enemies, battling his enemies, a rock meant uh, very significant things to David and to all the Israelites. Even Jesus used the, the uh, metaphor of the rock over and over in explaining the kingdom of God. The rock, it provides a shelter in the desert. He, these are not just stones. These are large foundational rocks that jut out from the earth. And in the heat of the day, you can actually just stand under the rock and it provides shelter from the sweltering heat. It provides shelter from the torrential rains that come at different periods of time. A rock is also a refuge from enemies. David would hide in the clefts of the rock, and the enemy could no longer see him. And he would peer out from the rock, from the safety of the rock. Also, David knew that the rock is a sure foundation when you're climbing up the hills of Judea in the Judean desert, uh, or in the En Gedi, where David uh, spent many a, a year uh, hiding and, and uh, running from Saul, you can easily slip uh, on the sand. It's very loose gravel in many places. And when your foot finds a rock, then you have a sure foundation. That's why Jesus uses the same metaphor. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. So when the rains come down, it will stand. And Jesus is that rock for David and for his people. We see this again in verses 31 and to 33. That the worthiness of the Lord. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. For who is God but the Lord? 
And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge, and he has made my way blameless. David is ascribing worthiness to this God of his, to this rock. This is where David lands as the reason for his deliverance, because only God is a rock. Only he is worthy. And he says that he made my way blameless. He goes on in verses 34 to 37. He made my feet like the feet of the deer. And he set me on the secure heights. He says he trains my hands. He gives me the shield. He has given me a wide place. That speaks of safety. When you're in a wide place in the desert, you can see your enemies all around when you're going through narrow areas, you have no idea what's behind the next rock. So David's painting a picture that those in Israel would understand. It's the Lord who does this. This is the work of the God who is worthy to be praised. And then David goes on in our third point, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't hit upon the section in the middle, verses 21 to 27. David speaks of the Lord dealing with him according to his righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. And it's very easy for us to read that and think, what is David talking about? Cleanness of your hands? Are, are you kidding me? The reader of First and Second Samuel knows the life of David. We've come to this place and we've seen his great sin with Bathsheba. We've seen his complicity in the death of Uriah. We, we, there's, there's rumors and hints all along of maybe he was involved in the death of Saul, the death of Abner. Now the writer dispels with those uh, rumors, and yet we know what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. And the writer of Samuel knows that we know that, and yet he puts us at the end. Because it's to prick our hearts to, to ask the question, what is David seeing here that I'm not seeing? How can he say this? It can sound so self-righteous to us on the surface. But the key is, let's look at verse 17. He says, he sent me from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Verse 18, he rescued me from my strong enemy. For they were too mighty for me. Verse 20, he rescued me because he delighted in me. David makes clear it's the worthy God, the rock, the deliverer, who is the one who caused him to be saved from his enemies. But in verses 21 to 27, David is now seeing himself the way the Lord sees him. See, we shouldn't take lightly the work of the Lord in our lives. There's no self-righteousness in saying, my hands are clean. The Lord deals with me because of my righteousness. Now, in the fullness of time, in the Lord Jesus, we understand more fully now, David was given this, this revelation that maybe he didn't fully understand, but he was looking forward to that day. He was looking forward to when his great son would pay and atone for his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. He knew it was not in himself. That righteousness is righteousness imputed to us, given to us by the worthy Lamb of God. That word worthy is rarely used in the Old Testament, actually. 
it, if you if you read through it, it's occasionally used kind of casually in terms of some of the patriarchs in some of their dealings. But it's really not until the book of Revelation that when the, the curtain is rolled back and the full revelation of the Son of God and His rule and His reign becomes evident to the, the whole world, that then come the cries of worthy, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. He alone is worthy of that praise and adoration. And David knew this. David could see by the, the Spirit of the Lord as a prophet that he was that this is what is coming. And, and it helps us today to see that in the Lord Jesus that the Lord sees us through the righteousness of His Son. We should cling to that and hang on to that when our conscience objects to that as somehow being self-righteous. No. Not me. I belong to Him. The Lord deals with me according to the cleanness of my hands. Praise be to the Lord Jesus for that truth. See, David knew that he was saved from his enemies. And it's instructive also to see that in the story of David, we don't see great miracles. We don't see uh, miracles wrought on David's behalf. Unlike Moses and Joshua before him, or even Elijah and Elisha after David, where the Lord worked great miracles to show his salvation to his people. See, David, again, remember, he's the anointed one of God. He is prefiguring for us the great son to come. His life was one of hardship, misery, being pursued by enemies. David was pursued like no one else in the Old Testament. Yes, sometimes for his sin, he was buffeted and disciplined by a loving father. But oftentimes he was pursued and hunted for no reason. He could say, I've kept your law. I, I, I've walked in righteousness in this area. But see, they wanted to kill the anointed one. The enemy, the great enemy of our soul, wants none of the anointed of God. To, to stand, to be preserved, to last. We're told he's a roaring lion seeking to devour those that he may. David could see the hand of God stretched out for him as clearly as if a miracle had been wrought at every turn. And does this not show to ordinary Christians, you and me, if we're careful to watch, if, if we are humble in spirit, we can look back over the course of our life and however quietly it may have passed by, the strong arm of the Lord who saves us, who preserves us from our enemies. In David's time as a, a type and a shadow of the one who was to come, his enemies were physical enemies. They sought his life. But we live in a time of relative peace and, and, and we, very few of us worry about someone coming to take our lives. In the fullness of the revelation in Jesus Christ, we see who our true enemy is. It's any of those who would oppose the Lord and his Christ. They are the enemies of God. And those, Jesus tells us, we are called to what? To love, to pray for, to lay down our lives for them if we must, and leave them to the righteous one who deals righteously. We, we don't need to strive against one another. 
that no man or woman is my enemy. They may be enemies of God. For remember, you and I once were enemies of God. But truly, sin and death are our enemies. And the good news is, is that the Lord Jesus has overcome them both. He has broken the power of sin in the life of his people. Sin no longer is a master over you. You are free from its dominion. Oh yes, we, we still have remnants of sin in our lives. And together with the Spirit's work, we are called to put to death our enemy. Put to death the remaining sin in our lives. But all along, we're looking forward to that day when the Lord Jesus will come and, as Paul says, He will vanquish the last enemy. He will destroy death. And it will be no more. In the closing verses of the psalm, we see David looking beyond the limits of an earthly kingdom. His eye seems to embrace this wide-spreading dominion of the Messiah, of the Christ. We see in verses 44, You delivered me from strife with my people, and you kept me as the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. Verse 48, The God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me. 49, Who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. And in 51, great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. The gaze of David is beyond himself. It's beyond his earthly rule. Paul, in Romans chapter 15, quotes from verse 50. He says, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. And Paul says this is proving that Jesus Christ came for the Gentile and the Jew alike. Praise God. For most of us here would not be here if the plan of God did not include all the nations. But He has. He has called us in. This is what we observe so commonly in the Psalms. Whether it's here in 2 Samuel or in, as this appears in Psalm 18. It's the kingdom of David melts and dissolves into view. And we see the kingdom of the Messiah. And this assurance is conveyed to each and every one of us as a believer in Jesus that as God protected David and his kingdom, so shall he protect and glorify the kingdom of his son Jesus forever and ever. This kingdom looks forward to that day. Back again in Revelation chapter 11. When the only one who is found worthy to open the seals of God, the worthy Lamb, and as he opens the seventh and final seal, it says the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And all were saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who was and who is, for you have taken great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, those who fear your name, both great and small. See, Christ reigns now in the hearts of his people and over the kingdom of this world. But one day he will be fully revealed. 
when his kingdom is fully consummated in the new heavens and the new earth. And knowing this, recognizing this, we look over our enemies, sin and death, and even those who oppose the Lord. And we look forward to that day with assurance. The Lord will preserve us. The Lord will protect us. He will deliver us from our enemies. Our hearts should long for that day and live in realization that truly worthy is the Lamb who is slain. And He will come in the fullness of His kingdom. Amen. If you would pray with me. Worthy are you, Lord Jesus, the Lamb that was slain on our behalf. Lord, we honor and praise and glorify your name. Lord, we see how worthy you are in, before the foundations of the world, establishing your kingdom and calling to your own your people, or not because of us, not to us, not to us, but to your name, belong all worth and glory and might. And Lord, we bow before you as your people. We, we trust in you that you will save us from our enemies. We need not fear. We need not strive. We need but trust in the work of your Spirit in our lives, in delivering us from the hand of our enemies, and in bringing us to your side. Lord, we long for that day. We look forward to that day where we will be with you forever and ever. Amen. And would you rise? I'm sorry, I don't have my bullets in that left. I don't know the hymn number. So it's I would have been singing in the black hymnal, number 63, in this rebel world.